Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Regional Economic Conditions webinar on conditions in the agricultural credit se sector. My name is Carmiana Matson. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Regional Outreach and Public Programs at the Minneapolis Fed, and I'm joined today by our regional economist, Joe Mann. Before I turn things over to him, a couple of announcements. He will have some time at the end of his presentation for Q&A. So if you do have questions, please submit those in the chat box on Zoom, and I will pose those to Joe verbally at the end of his presentation. We will be following up with you next week via email to send you a link to Joe's slides, as well as a copy of the video of this presentation. Also, we've got additional survey results on our website. I've posted a link in the chat box to those additional survey results. When our webinar is over, we'd love to get your feedback on this presentation. So we'd appreciate if you take a moment to fill out the three questions that are gonna pop up at the end of this Zoom webinar. And we'd love for you to join us at our next Regional Economic Conditions webinar, which is on conditions in the construction sector. That'll be held on Friday, December 16th at 9 a.m. Central Time, and we'll post a link for registration in the chat. And with that, I will pass it over to Joe. All right, thank you, Carmi. And thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I'm gonna be talking about our latest survey results, which were just published this week. Um, just a quick disclaimer before I get started, though, that I uh, am speaking for myself in uh, sharing any opinions that I might have, and uh, not necessarily for my colleagues in the Federal Reserve. Um, <clears throat> so with that out of the way, here is what I'm going to be going over uh, this morning. I'm going to be sharing with you the results of our latest quarterly survey of agricultural credit conditions in the 9th Federal Reserve District. So I'll start by telling you more about our district and about that survey itself before I get into what the survey actually told us uh, about agricultural conditions in our region at harvest time. Um, it's a particularly interesting quarter to look at uh, year over year uh, when we get these results in on a quarterly basis. Uh, really, the third quarter is kind of one of the most interesting ones because we get a we get a good reading on agriculture during uh, during harvest time. Um, <clears throat> and so as not to keep you in suspense, uh, the the results that we got were pretty good. Uh, we, we were finding uh, based on the, what what farm lenders in our region are telling us that uh, farm incomes uh, have continued to increase over last year, which was itself a strong year. I'll tell you more about what that looks like in a minute. Uh, land values are uh, are still really soaring. Um, the pace of growth maybe slowed down a little bit in the third quarter, but in year-over-year -year terms, uh, they're up a lot. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And the outlook for, at least for the near future, for the rest of 2022, for the fourth quarter, is generally uh, positive in terms of uh, in terms of the income picture, uh, not necessarily as positive if you are an ag banker, uh, because you do your, uh, your 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 business by lending to farmers, and farmers have lower demand for loans at the moment because their incomes are are pretty strong. So I'll go over those results in more detail in a minute. Uh, but that's kind of the quick summary of what uh, what the what the survey shows us. In case you need to jump off before the half hour mark when we wrap up. And as Carmi said, I will have some time to take questions at the end. I don't plan to fill the whole half hour with my remarks. Um, <clears throat> so a quick word on uh, on our uh, district. Um, this is the, the region of the country that the Fed, Minneapolis Fed represents, the Ninth Federal Reserve District. You can see it on the map here. We cover the states of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and we also have uh, <clears throat> Montana. And then we have portions of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. As you probably can imagine, this is a heavily agricultural region. Agriculture is a really strong part uh, of the really important part of the economy in our region. And so our, our survey that we do covers all of the states in this region, except for, I should point out, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is not included in the survey. And the reason for that is because just due to its climate and uh, soil conditions in the UP. Most of the UP uh, is not uh, really uh, really great uh, agricultural or at least crop producing region. So the agriculture sector is relatively small in the UP compared certainly to the other states in our region. And we don't really have any prominent agricultural lenders in the UP as a result. And the survey itself is a survey of ag lenders. And so, uh, so we don't really cover the Upper Peninsula in the survey. Um, however, I should mention our colleagues at the Chicago Fed uh, cover the Lower Peninsula of Michigan uh, in their region, and they produce a similar uh, quarterly survey of agricultural credit conditions that does give you results for the Lower Peninsula of Michigan if you're interested in that. So this is our region. 
It's the states we cover in the ninth district. And as I mentioned, agriculture is uh, pretty important in our region. And as such, we have uh, a lot of financial institutions of banks that are concentrated in agriculture. Uh, what we mean by concentrated in agriculture in this case is that they have a significant portion of their loan portfolio uh, either tied up in loans to agricultural producers or collateralized uh, and or I should say collateralized by farmland. And so that's what we mean. That's what I mean by ag bankers. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out we're calling this a survey. Uh, I would think of it more as a poll or a panel of experts. Uh, it's not a very large survey because there aren't a lot of, uh, of agricultural banks. Um, I should also point out that the banks that we're surveying are Federal Reserve member banks. So we're not including all of the community and state chartered banks uh, that are heavily involved in our region in agricultural lending. Um, just those that are Federal Reserve members, but there are a significant number of uh, member banks in our region that are concentrated in agriculture. So by, by connecting with them on a quarterly basis and surveying them about what they're seeing in ag conditions in the areas that they cover and among their customers, we get a good reading on the state of agriculture. So it's not a scientific survey in the sense of being a random sample, certainly not a random sample of farmers or agricultural producers. Uh, because we're 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 surveying lenders, uh, but these are lenders who know a lot about the business because uh, an important part of their business is is lending uh, to farmers. Um, <clears throat> And in October, the survey that we uh, that I'm going to be presenting to you today, uh, we we got a response back from 49 of the bankers in our region, little uh, it, a little bit lower than uh, we we often do. That number, the number of of banks in the region overall, and the number of member banks that are concentrated in agriculture has been declining over time. Uh, so 49, uh, just below, we usually do slightly more than 50. Um, <clears throat> but a good number and good representation across the region. And one more thing I should mention just in terms of the timing of this, I keep referring to it as a quarterly survey. So this survey covers a, uh, a three month period. It, it's conducted after the three months are over. So you can see uh, in the bullets here, I have the months in which they're conducted. So the October survey uh, was covering the months from July through September. It was conducted in October asking these lenders, how did things go in the last three months among your clients? And what do you expect to happen in the three months ahead in the in the last quarter of the year, in this case, in the, uh, the months of October through December? So really, um, as I mentioned earlier, a very opportune time to check in with these lenders and get a sense of what's happening in agriculture, because in a lot of cases, this is happening either just after harvest time or... Um, <clears throat> Uh, or, or as as harvests are actively proceeding, um, and so we got a good sense of what was happening, uh, really, as 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 farmers were harvesting their crops. I should mention, actually, just to go back recent, briefly, um, not only is agriculture a large and important part of our region, it's also fairly diversified. So, uh, if you look at Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, <clears throat> the Dakotas as well major producers of corn and soybeans. Minnesota is one of the nation's largest producers of corn and the nation's second largest producer of hogs. You go further to the west, Montana is one of the, the second largest producer of wheat in the country, and it's one of the largest producers of cattle as well. So, so ranching, very important in Montana. And it's important in the western Dakotas as well. And of course, dairy, also very important in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So pretty diversified, and you get a different picture, as I'll show you in a moment, of how conditions are geographically kind of based on, uh, on, on, on what uh, commodities are more represented in the different regions. So <clears throat> to give you kind of, the, again, the brief overview of, uh, of, of what we're finding in the survey in the third quarter, incomes were up uh, a little less uh, uh, robust income growth in the drought areas. Um, <clears throat> and that's despite higher input costs. So I want to point out the last time I did one of these webinars on our ag credit conditions was uh, was at the beginning of the, the growing season in May, going over the first quarter results. And we had a lot of concerns at that time over inflation in agricultural inputs and, uh, and those weighing down on incomes. We're still seeing growth in incomes, though, uh, through the third quarter of this year. So the, 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 the strong crop prices that we're seeing uh, seem to be out, outpacing uh, those higher costs of production, even in areas that were hit by drought. can talk about that more if folks have questions about that in the Q&A period. Um, we also asked the lenders about uh, spending by farm households. Those are up as well. Capital spending is up on balance, but not, as, not up as strongly as income or, uh, or household spending, consumer spending, that is, by farm households. Um, 
Uh, part of that has to do with supply chain issues and the availability of capital. And we got some availability of equipment. Uh, we got some comments about that. Rates of loan repayment are up. Um, as you might expect, when farmers have more cash, they're going to pay down their loans faster. And the demand for loans is down as well. So I'll show you the breakout of these results. As I mentioned, uh, land values, we ask about on a quarterly basis. We ask what's happening to the value of an acre of land in your area. And uh, compared to a year ago, those are up pretty sharply. I'll show you what those look like state by state in a minute. And the outlook for, for incomes, at least in the fourth quarter, is positive on balance, although a little bit more modest than what we've seen over recent quarters. So here's the breakdown of results for farm income and spending. So I keep referring to growth in farm incomes. I want to be clear that what we're asking about in the survey is not how many dollars do you expect farm uh, uh, farms to make? What do you expect farm revenues to be? We only ask them, did you see over the previous three months farm incomes increase, decrease, or stay the same? And what you can see in the breakdown in this table here of the results for income and spending is that nearly three quarters of the lenders told us that that farm incomes grew in the third quarter of, of 2022 relative to a year ago. That's an important uh, caveat to make there. So um, not necessarily making these, co these comparisons on a quarterly basis, and that's because Farm incomes, as you might imagine, are heavily seasonal, especially in the uh, in the in the crop producing uh, space of, of agriculture. And so we asked them to make these comparisons on a year over year basis. So a year ago at this time, when we were when we were asking about this comparison, we had a really large uh, proportion of lenders telling us that that incomes had increased because crop prices were really strong. And so we're seeing growth off of that high level that we saw a year ago. So pretty strong incomes. And this is consistent with what we're seeing in the numbers from the USDA about uh, net uh, net cash income from farms uh, has been up. And in fact, net farm income, uh, looking at like a record nationwide. Um, so these are consistent with what we're seeing from the USDA. You can see that on balance, uh, more of the lenders also told us that uh, capital purchasing uh, by five farms had increased and that household spending, a majority of lenders told us that, that household spending by farms was up. Just to give you an idea of how this compares with uh, results over time in the survey, you can see this is just a, this is just a plot over time of the percentage of respondents to the survey who told us that that farm incomes had either increased uh, or were unchanged relative to a year ago on a quarterly basis. And what you can see is that that percentage ticked down slightly in the third quarter. Uh, maybe not surprising again, given the 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 the, the increasing input costs and uh, and drought in some of our region. But it's still hovering above ninety percent in the range that it was in previous kind of boom times in agriculture that you can see on the chart here. Most recently, in the the early part of last decade, when we were going through a prolonged period of very high commodity prices and very strong farm incomes. So we're we're continuing over the last year or so to be at that level. And again, I want to point out that these are year over year comparisons we're asking them to make. So if you look going back to the third quarter of 2021, big share of lenders telling us that incomes were up. And so we're growing off of a pretty strong level. Uh, and again, that's consistent with the results that we're seeing uh, from, from the USDA as well. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick breakdown of uh, demand for loans. So as I mentioned earlier, you might expect when farms are making more money, they have less need to borrow to finance ongoing operations. It's a regular part of of uh, of 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 agricultural uh, business is is uh, operating loans, financing ongoing operations with short term loans that you pay off when cash receipts come in, and uh, nearly half of the lenders that we surveyed, or forty five percent, told us that loan demand had decreased in the third quarter relative to a year earlier. Um, <clears throat> on balance, repayment rates were up, so more more uh, <clears throat> more ag producers repaying loans that they had, uh, the majority, slight majority told us that there was no change in repayment rates. Only 4% said that repayment had decreased. And renewals, very, very steady. More than three quarters told us there was no change in renewal. So those in, in, in those producers who were rolling over existing loans and renewing the, loan, the lines of credit that they had, uh, holding very steady and again, consistent with, um, with, with relatively robust farm incomes. Turning forward to the future, we're st at least into into the near future, the quarter that we're in right now, the lender the lenders that we surveyed were expecting continued growth on balance in farm incomes in Q4. Again, the comparison we're asking them to make is to a year earlier, so fourth quarter of 2022 compared to the last three months of 2021, just over half of lenders told us that they expect income growth. Uh, year over year in this current quarter that we're in right now through the end of the year. 
um, <clears throat> a little bit uh, more modest percentage relative to uh, to the the backward looking results I just showed you, but still positive on balance. Again, positive outlook for uh, household spending and capital spending, but those are also a little bit more modest uh, outlook for the the uh, for the, the 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 fourth quarter. <laughs> Looking forward to expectations for credit conditions for loan demand and repayment rates. Uh, those are looking more stable in the fourth quarter. Pretty mixed breakdown of those lenders uh, expecting an increase in loan demand versus a decrease versus not changing. Slightly higher percentages expecting increased loan demands uh, or no change compared to decrease, but a relatively even breakdown. And that's, again, consistent with kind of the variation we're seeing uh, in in uh, farm incomes across our region and in ag performance across our region. I'll share some comments at the end of, uh, of my presentation here from, from the lenders. Pretty steady outlook for both loan repayment, um, <clears throat> which is expected to be up on balance, but especially for renewals, very similar. Uh, not much expectation for any change in renewal activity. Um, <clears throat> so, why not a uh, why not a stronger uh, stronger demand for loans? Well, this might be part of the story. Uh, it's interesting that we actually have as many as uh, close to a third. Uh, just over a third telling us that they expect loan demands to increase in the fourth quarter, given what we know about what's happened to the cost of financing a loan. Uh, so as you are aware, the Federal Reserve has been tightening monetary policy by raising its benchmark interest rate and other market interest rates rise in, uh, in accordance with that. And you can see that just by looking over the last couple of quarters at what's happened to rates on agricultural loans. So obviously these, the People that we're the, that we're polling in this survey are the experts on what it costs to finance uh, an agricultural loan, and so we asked them about what the prevailing interest rate is on a variety of different loan categories, and you can see those on the legend uh, down at the bottom of this chart here. But we're asking them what the fixed and variable rates are on operating and uh, machinery loans. And as you can see in all of those categories, since the beginning of this year, there's been a pretty pretty market uptick uh, back to levels that they were prior to the pandemic in which they'd been uh, climbing for some time, uh, again, coinciding with a slight tightening cycle uh, uh, from the Fed. Um, so pretty strong response in agricultural interest rates uh, to, to uh, the monetary policy environment that we're seeing right now, uh, and that's reflected in, uh, in, in what we're hearing from these lenders. Um, not surprisingly, maybe given that um, uh, that uh, that that the cost of operating a farm is up so much due to the inflation and input prices, um, <clears throat> and the kind of uncertain outlook, we're seeing farmers holding on to more cash. So this is the result of a special question that we asked on this survey. I thought it would be I thought it was interesting enough to share. Uh, we asked whether uh, we asked what changes in borrower liquidity. Uh, farm lenders were seeing uh, over the quarter. Uh, so we just asked them uh, whether it, again, as with the other questions, whether it, whether it increased or decreased or whether it hadn't changed. And the vast majority told us that borrower liquidity, that is the amount of uh, the amount of cash uh, on hand, the income and cash holdings, uh, had increased uh, over the previous quarter relative to a year ago, and roughly similar expectations for the fourth quarter. Uh, <clears throat> So farmers making more cash and holding on to a significant share of it uh, <clears throat> is what uh, you can kind of take away from that lower demand for loans and for the response to this question. And again, I think that's an acknowledgement of, uh, of the increased um, operating cost and uncertainty in the environment. Um, one thing that's interesting in terms of the effects of higher interest rates that we really didn't see um, in the last quarter was um, was uh, really any kind of negative or drag on land values. In particular, uh, just the opposite, land values are up markedly from a year ago. Now, I should point out that we, again, I'm making this comparison on a year-over-year -year basis. We saw a lot of growth in the earlier quarters of this year, and uh, compared to the the growth that we had seen in the earlier iterations of the survey this year, the annualized growth in land values in our district had come down a little bit, but it's still pretty strong. I mean, we we're talking about a 20% increase in non-irrigated land values across the Ninth Federal Reserve District, and you can see the breakdown in some of the different states here. 24% in Minnesota, up as much as 30% in in uh, in North Dakota. Uh, so across the region, uh, pretty strong growth in land values, um, and that's again what you might expect given 
uh, higher farm incomes, more robust crop price environment. And this is also consistent with the data that we receive from the USDA. On an annual basis, the USDA releases uh, estimates of farm value, farmland values across the country. And these growth rates are pretty consistent. Um, although I should be, I should point out that these are growth rates pre-inflation. If you're interested, uh, I wrote an article earlier this year about what those what those land values look like when you adjust them for inflation. And they're still up, but as you might imagine, not as much. <clears throat> we also ask about cash rents, so producers can lease land from owners uh, and produce on it. And this is another regular part of doing business. Cash rents are up quite a bit too, so it costs more to lease an acre of farmland. Uh, but not as much uh, uh, as uh, it's increased as the the cost of purchasing an acre of farmland has increased. Uh, so you can see across the district, cash rent on an acre of non-irrigated farmland is up 11% year over year, uh, compared to 20% in the district, 14% in Minnesota, compared to 24%, and in in North and South Dakota, 9% uh, increase. So uh, uh, positive. Uh, <clears throat> growth in cash rents, uh, except for Wisconsin, where I need to caution with a relatively smaller number of respondents, uh, where we saw basically no change in uh, in cash rents from a year earlier. Um, <clears throat> so that's you know consistent with the overall cost of operating a farm rising. It not only costs more to purchase fertilizer and pesticide, not only costs more to purchase feed for animals and uh, to purchase equipment, but it also costs more to buy land or to uh, or to rent land as well. So before I uh, I finish up and um, and take some questions, I just thought it was interesting to share some of the comments that we got that kind of show how even though uh, on in the aggregate the 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 results from the survey are pretty positive, it varies quite a bit across the region. Uh, I'll point to in the middle of that second column there just a, a a very nice succinct summary statement from one of our lenders: good prices, dry conditions, higher interest rates. I thought that was uh, was a nice enough summary that I actually led the the article on these results uh, with that quote. Um, and I and I and I give you three different quotes from North Dakota because I think it's interesting to compare how much variation there is even within the same state, uh, just be just due to climate, uh, weather conditions, and uh, and some of the other uh, some of the other uh, considerations, the the mix of commodities that vary across the state. And you know, we have one lender from North Dakota saying we've got strong crops and higher commodity prices, and that's putting more cash in farmers' pockets. And then another person saying that farm income is decreasing due to uh, lower commodity prices and higher expenses. Um, they're probably talking about a different mix of commodities and a different mix of expenses. Um, but it's interesting because, again, in contrast to the average on the survey, that lender told us that they saw an increase in demand for operating loans over the past three months. So it really does depend a lot on the weather, and it depends on where you are. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and again, another another quote from North Dakota. Somebody somebody mentioning that that crops are in decent condition, uh, but the the uh, it's it's pretty hard to find the machinery to harvest it or the workforce uh, the the workers to uh, to get the crop out of the fields, and that's going to make it tough uh, to get in. And this is another uh, another expense and consideration that a lot of lenders and 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 producers have shared with us. Uh, we know that that's been a, a a big challenge over the last few years is getting adequate labor for. Uh, for uh, for farms, uh, for harvests and and uh, and ongoing operations has has gotten to be more intensive a challenge than it even usually is. Um, so a lot a lot more comments on the survey, and there's some more details in our article if you're interested in uh, <clears throat> in perusing that. That's on our website, and still have a few minutes left over if um, if anyone in the audience has questions. If you do have questions for Joe submit those via the chat box on Zoom. And Joe, why don't you start with, can you kind of unpack, we heard you say there's still a concern about input costs, and yet it seems yeah. like farm incomes are really pretty solid. So why are we still hearing this concern? Yeah, so when we hear concerns about income costs, I think that they're longer term concerns. And so so when the survey, we have such a sort of a short uh, you know, it's a sort of a narrow window of time that we're looking at. What happened over the last three months? What do you expect over the coming three months? And really, we're within the same year here. So we know that input costs have gone up quite a bit. Crop prices are really strong, and that's having that that's outweighing the increase in, in input costs. Um, <clears throat> but the concern that we're really hearing is what's going to happen if crop prices or other commodity prices come back down. Um, and 
part of the reason that we haven't seen a bigger impact uh, of those higher input costs is because a lot of producers purchased their inputs well in advance. So they were producing this year on uh, fertilizer and inputs that they had purchased last year. And now they've seen double digit, some cases 40% increases or maybe even more in the price of fertilizer. And they're gonna be have to be they're gonna have to be buying that for next year. And they're really seriously looking at altering the mix of what they produce based on how much more expensive those are. Because you're taking a lot of risk when you're essentially gambling that the price of, say, corn or soybeans is going to stay as high as it is right now and justify those higher input costs. So that's really where the concern is. It's more of a, it's more of a, a longer term uh, concern, or at least into the next production year. Thank you. How about, can you talk to us a little bit more about drought and the impact that we're seeing of drought in the district? Yeah, so that was another surprising one because we had really severe drought in uh, in some parts of our region, particularly in Montana, especially. I actually traveled to Montana with my colleague Shannon Lewis from uh, the, the Helena branch. Um, at the end of the summer, we visited Montana's Golden Triangle, their kind of major wheat producing region, barley producing region. Uh, during harvest time, which is a fascinating trip, but the amount of grain that they were getting there uh, was significantly lower than what they're used to getting, um, and even even in a dry year. Uh, so they had a really significant drought. And you can go on the um, uh, the National Drought Monitor, the National Weather Service uh, operates, and kind of see what that looks like in that area. Um, <clears throat> so you might expect that having a severe drought and having much lower crop production would be a pretty big drag on incomes. And indeed it was. However, wheat prices were so high in part due to the crisis in Eastern Europe um, and the market's reaction to the war in Ukraine um, that even with much lower yields in uh, wheat producing regions, a lot of them were still seeing not even, not, even, not even the ability to break even, but actually to still operate at a decent profit even with the reduced yields that they were getting. Um, so that was one part of the picture. The other important part of the picture to point out is that in, uh, especially in drought prone regions, a lot of farmers are heavily insured. And so they purchase crop insurance and they have to make a decision at some point during the growing season, whether they're gonna take the lower yield that they're getting and see what they can, um, see what they can earn uh, by marketing their crop uh, with a lower yield, but higher market price versus uh, taking the payout on their insurance. And a lot of them are taking the payouts on their insurance um, but those end up still still providing them with some income as well. So it's not like they're operating at a total loss. Those insurance programs are pretty important, especially as we see the continued effects of climate change and um, as farmers become more prone to severe weather episodes. Um, so that's an important point to make as well. Thank you. I think we'll have time for one last question, and it's actually about what you just ended on, Joe. You had mentioned the concern from one of the farmers about the workforce yeah. to even get access to the crops. That's not something we've heard you say in these webinars prior to this one. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the workforce concerns? Well, the, the need for labor um, from farm operations varies depending on what commodities you produce, but most mostly what we're talking about here is harvest time labor uh, from uh, from crop producers, and we heard a lot of concerns. Uh, it's not any secret that um, there's a lot of uh, migrant labor, international workers uh, who travel the country on work visas, uh, agricultural work visas, are called H H one A's, um, during harvest time. Um, there's been, uh, we'll say, there's been a lot of contention about the number of visas and how easy they are to get. But there's also been, since the onset of the pandemic, a little bit less willingness of some of those international laborers to to travel uh, around the region. I think that that, uh, based on it, anecdotally, what I've heard got a little bit better over the last year. But the labor supply for harvest labor is still really tight, particularly at harvest time. Now, when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about cattle ranching or dairy operations, their needs for farm labor are quite a bit different. They tend to need it at different times of the year, say during calving season or a dairy operations, really kind of an on, ongoing basis. And they're sort of always struggling with that. But what we heard more this year was, and particularly for some reason in North Dakota, we heard another, I've heard a number of comments about the difficulty accessing uh, uh, seasonal farm labor. Right. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. We'll be following up with all of you next week with a link to this video, as well as a copy of Joe's slides. And you can, of course, read the rest of Joe's survey results on our website that is in the chat. We hope you will join us for our next Regional Economic Conditions webinar on December 16th on conditions in the construction sector. And before you sign off, we'd love to get your feedback on this webinar. Please answer the three questions that'll pop up at the close of this Zoom. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great Thank day. Thank you.